Honor. <coughs> S16G1751, Malicia Spencer versus the state, Thomas Thomas for appellant, William Kennedy for appellee. Mr. Thomas, when you're ready to proceed, sir. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning. My name is indeed Thomas Thomas. I, uh, Mom was obviously a little stumped, but uh, <laughs> so, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm not my own law firm, but I do sound like one, it, and I'm not a misprint. Uh, let me uh, thank you very much for having us, uh, from behalf of Ms. Spencer and myself. Uh, when we go through law school, we often wonder where our careers will take us. I would be, had I been able to talk to myself years ago, I would be so delighted to say that I would be practicing in front of the highest court in my state and for the second time. So I'm delighted to be here. And this case actually does sort of take me back to law school. I can remember um, sitting in class one day and a professor was droning on about, at law you cannot do indirectly what you cannot do directly. And that principle has stuck with me, and luckily it did, because I think that is the theme of this entire case today. What this is all about is the state attempted to use um, one of the field evaluations called the horizontal gaze nystagmus test, and I promise I'm not gonna bore you with the details of how all that works. I bore enough juries with that um, in my practice. It is called HGN for short, and that's in this anacronym-driven world, that's what we tend to call it, and I am, I am trying to watch my time. I would like a little rebuttal, I should have mentioned that, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so the question is, can the state give a numeric alcohol content from the HGN? Can they say you're 0.08 or higher? Or can they actually give a number? And, and Count, that, counsel, that's not really even the question before us in, on the facts of this case, is it? It's not that the defendant or the, the state uh, produce testimony relative to a specific numerical value of blood alcohol content, the officer's testimony was as to a range. So can you speak to, to how that applies? Because that's yeah. how they distinguish it, I believe. Yes, yes, I was getting getting to that. I, I believe they, the exact testimony of the officer was generally, it means 0.08 or higher. Correct. Okay, so, so <coughs> at, we would use the Latin phrase for that. The, those are weasel words to get around, uh, <laughs> to get around sneaking in the blood alcohol content um, th through the back door. That is why they're trying to do indirectly what they cannot do directly. There is no, and Harper, of course, is the pivotal case for criminal scientific evidence. Uh, has that procedure reached scientific, is it verifiable in the scientific community? It's not verifiable generally. It's not verifiable as to a range. There's no testimony in this case whatsoever that there is, uh, it's verified in the scientific community that you can say, based on a certain number of clues, you're going to be 0.08 or higher. Okay? And of course, 0.08 magically is the limit, the, the, um, the statutorily prescribed blood alcohol limit. If <laughs> for, for per se cases, right? For per se cases, This yes. wasn't a per se case, was it? It was not a per se case, which, which brings us back a little bit to uh, Webb versus the state, and all the sites are in the brief, uh, and, and the sort of com, uh, complicated history of the HGN. In Webb was a less safe case, and the state attempted to put a number in, in Webb, through the HGN. Uh, and, the, and the court said that the objection was not relevant because this is not a per se case. And the Court of Appeals said, oh yes, that's extremely relevant. Uh, that, the, the, they had a blood alcohol content above the legal limit is, is extremely relevant even in a less safe case. Now in a little footnote, they put, now we're not gonna get to the issue of whether that's, this is scientifically admissible under Harper, because you didn't object to that, you just object to relevance. So the, the issue about whether 0.08 um, is relevant in a less safe case has been resolved in Webb. Have, have we said that it is? No, this is the Court of Appeals, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, this is Webb, and in a footnote they said, but we're, we're not touching on the scientific issue because you didn't raise that, Defense Counsel. Well, Defense Counsel, we do read the footnotes, and we read that one, 
And um, a few years later, this came squarely in front of the Court of Appeals again in Bravo versus the state. And in Bravo, they actually introduced a bunch of studies produced by the same people who make the test, but that's beside the point. They produced study and the officer said, yeah, I've, I've seen these studies and that's what I'm basing this, my ability to give you a numeric reading here, okay? And they objected under Harper that it hadn't reached the stage of scientifically verifiable. And no one disagrees about that. Court of Appeals, in its opinion, said, right, that's, it's, that hasn't reached the Harper standard. Our sister states don't think it's reached the Harper standard. That, that issue has been resolved. And here, well, all they- hadn't, hadn't been resolved by us. No, it has not, I'm sorry. In, in, yes. It, and, the, and one of the things about science is it's not static. So even if it was quote unquote resolved in cases in our court of appeals or everywhere else in the country over a few years, there could have been a blockbuster study last a month and it would suddenly be verifiable, right? Yes, Your Honor. Had, okay. had, so, that, had that been put into evidence so we could right. counter it with our experts and we could have that scientific duel, which maybe someday we will have. Okay, but it's not enough to say, well, other courts at some point in the past have said it wasn't. I mean, that's some evidence at that point it wasn't, but it's not proof that today it couldn't be. No, no, absolutely not. It, science advances all the time. They, they may also show, a study may show it's complete baloney too. Right. We, we don't have either, any of that before us today. We only have Bravo where this was looked at previously by the Court of Appeals and they said it, it, there's, it's not verifiable scientifically under Harper. Okay. And the state didn't put in any scientific evidence. They just asked the officer, based on your training and experience, do you see, is there a correlation between the horizontal gaze and the stagnus and blood alcohol content? So are you asking us to find that this, that this level of verifiable accuracy could never be shown or that it wasn't shown in your client's trial? Wasn't shown in my tri client's trial. I can't predict what science, science may show us tomorrow. It may show us the HGN has been a big mistake all along, and they may show that it <coughs> has more value than we thought. We, we don't know. In this particular case, the foundation that the state put in was based on your training and experience. And this court, this court has already considered that, that very issue in CAR. In that case, the state tried to put in um, arson sniffing dogs. They, they, the theory was that our dogs can smell accelerants and they can, if they alert in a certain way, it's a certain accelerant. And they had a long hearing about that and the officer said, yes, based on our training, training of the dogs, they can do that. They put in a lot of anecdotal evidence that yes, in previous cases, the dogs had actually done this and this court said, no, that's all great. What you're lacking is scientific evidence under Harper that it's verified and accepted that these dogs can do this. Counsel, uh, getting away from the dog sniffing case and going back to DUI cases for just a moment, how does the scientific foundational evidence in this case before the court compare to the scientific foundational evidence that was present in Kirkland where you had an officer testifying to nearly identical language? Uh, That's that issue here. In, in Kirkland, if you'll notice carefully, they also had a, a breath test in Kirkland. Um, and uh, it, and the actual question... In fact, the officer was asked to, to, to draw a correlation between the HGN test results and a person's blood alcohol content, but also had before him evidence of an intoxilizer. Right. The, okay. ac the actual question, which I put down in my brief, um, is they asked him, based on what you observed in the HGN and what you read on the intoxilizer, can you give us opinion as to the person's blood alcohol content? And and the, and the answer is sure, I can give an opinion because I've got, I've got both in front of me. So um, Kirkland, they had that additional fact. And whereas here, this is square, this is, there is no intoxilizer, there's not even a handheld intoxilizer, there's, there's nothing but the HGN and the officers. The foundation he gave was not based on other evidence or plus other evidence, it's just on my training and experience and the HGN alone, I can, I can tell whether you're 0.08 or higher. Macy, uh, is it your arg argument, Mr. Thomas, that the horizontal gaze nystagmus test has no meaningful input in a DUI case? In other words, it's just 
it's, it's no good. Absolutely not. Again, what, what, what do you say it is good for, and where was it not used here in a good for, if you may? Certainly. All field evaluations perform an essential function of establishing probable cause to take somebody off the road. Let's suppose that any reasonable person thinks that a person is 30 or 40 percent chance this person shouldn't be driving. What reasonable person wouldn't take that person off the road? Because you, you don't want a tragedy to happen. So at trial, the whole thing flips around. It's now, is it beyond a reasonable doubt that they were intoxicated to the point they couldn't drive? Not whether or not there's a substantial chance that some, something bad I, may happen. I, I don't get that. You're saying people can be arrested based on garbage science as long as they're not convicted based on garbage science? No, I, I'm saying that. The, I mean, the science, the, I don't know why the standard would be any different for probable cause and for and for a conviction. Because it's been scientifically established that horizontal gaze and stagnus evaluations can indicate someone may be less safe to drive. Okay, well if that's if if that's the case and that does seem to be the case, it seems like the officer could both arrest based on that at, at that's a, one piece of evidence of impairment and could also testify that there is a correlation between HGN and impairment. I there is a correlation, well-established correlation between positive HGN tests and impairment, right? Yes. He and can testify to that. And I have the opportunity to refute that evidence because I can have my client testify that I wasn't impaired. She had a witness that came in and said she wasn't impaired. I, I, there, and the officer will also always testify, yes, I don't decide just on one of my battery, I decide on all three and I put them all together. And I can say, you didn't decide on the HGN, right? You didn't arrest right after that. He goes, no, 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 I, I wait until I have all the evidence before me. I gather these other, these other indicators and whether she can talk and whether how she's walking, a lot of other factors go into that and it can be refuted by us. Counsel, do, do I understand your response to Justice Namias' question to be conceding that four clues on an HGN test is in fact evidence of impairment as opposed to blood alcohol content? It can be, it can be evidence of impairment. It is not the final word. It is a piece of evidence that the state can produce and that we can argue about and attempt to refute and say, no, we were walking fine. We were talking fine. There's a specific case, and I, it's in the brief, where they even said, okay, people's responses to alcohol vary. So the less safe standard depends on the person, a lot of variable conditions because people don't respond to this alcohol in the same way. Well, Mr. Thomas, do you, in there, real, I know it's an old case, but and I can't quote it exactly, but I think the word is something like this. A person is under the influence of alcohol when that person is less safe to drive if that person was not so under the influence of alcohol. So how does, if you're saying you can use it there, I mean, and in those old cases, you could actually, you know, you could try a DUI case without a, a breathalyzer or I think, or anything. Uh, if, you, if, if, if you can persuade the trier of fact that that person is under the influence. But, but I believe you're saying that the horizontal nystagmus test, gaze test, is an element of showing under the influence. Yes, absolutely. In a less safe case, they can introduce it for that purpose. <clears throat> That's not what they did here. They introduced it to show someone had a specific blood alcohol content over the legal limit. I thought that I thought the state contends they didn't do it for that purpose. Did they not? Well, it's it's what goes in the jury's ears. That's the purpose. What, if Okay, if, if it's, why would they say you're 0.08 or higher, induce that evidence twice, because after I objected, they did it, they went back through it again and had him say it again over my continuing objection. If, if, if they don't realize that's a devastating piece of evidence that has, that is not scientifically verified, it is not scientifically verified, and they didn't introduce any foundation of this, right. that you can say that your blood alcohol content is about point out. There are people in this world that can be less safe at 0.05 right. because they don't respond well to alcohol. And it, it, so that's, but they are putting in, this is over you, you, the legal Your limit. contention is the state put it in, the horizontal gaze and the stagmas test to determine a percent. The, to, 
to make the jury think that my client was a .08 or higher and therefore was above the per se limit, which everyone, as everyone should, everyone knows that's, what, what other purpose would they put it in there? I, I didn't object when they said, this isn't, can be an indicator of impairment. Yes, this can be an indicator of impairment. Because I know I'm gonna cross examine, we're gonna bring out all sorts of facts, there's gonna be, I can, I can, I can deal with less safe to drive. And I can deal with the range of that. I cannot deal with pseudoscience. I cannot have somebody say, this means you're 0.08 based on something that is not scientifically verifiable. I can't refute that unless I bring in my own experts and scientists and, that, and that's what it becomes. And up until then, Bravo in all these cases had said, you can't give a number based on HGN because that's not been verified in the scientific community. And there's even less foundation laid here than there was in Bravo. So what's going to happen is they're going to start bringing per se cases based on HGNs. They're going to throw out all the protections that we have for the intoxilizer. You have to be trained. You have to show your card. That machine gets inspected four times a year. They have to show that it's inspected and all. We have all these safeguards around the .08 standard because we know how devastating it is. In fact, you can be convicted on a .08 with no evidence that you're actually intoxicated. If you, that's a per se case. We have all these safeguards training the officers, certifying their training, they get refresher courses, we inspect the machines, all these safeguards about that, an actual number. And now we're gonna let it in through the HGN with no scientific foundation, no, he's not a, he, he, this was a pretty good officer, but anybody who goes to the academy gets, gets this training. All of them can bring this in and go, hey, you're, yeah, that, that's one way. Now there's a huge contention whether that's really true in the scientific community, but that's beside the point because nobody laid that foundation. So they're gonna be able to get in this number, dodging all the safeguards for the intoxilizers and blood tests and all those sort of things with an HGN, and I'm not gonna be able to refute it. That's, that's the danger here. Uh, and that, is, that has never been the case in, in Georgia. That's what we relied on, um, that, that, that that's reached scientific verifiable that we, they can do that. Yes, as to less safe, the, you can do the walk and turn. Can you stand on one leg and count to 30? That is evidence that you're less safe to drive. Now, can everybody in the world stand on one leg and count to 30? Probably not, so it can be refuted. Everything about less safe can be argued back and forth. I can't fight pseudoscience. I can't fight a number based on a test which has not, not been verified scientifically. It sounds like science, it looks like science, it smells like science, except that science doesn't approve it. I, I, I will stop. I have three minutes left, yes. Um, <clears throat> may it please the court, my name is William Kennedy. I represent the appellee, the state of Georgia. The question presented by this court was whether the court of appeal erred in holding that the officer's testimony correlating the HDN test results to a range of blood alcohol content was properly admitted. The response to that is no, the court of appeals did not err for two reasons. The state laid the proper foundation to admit into evidence the HDN test results upon which the officer could determine that the appellant was less safe to drive due to alcohol. And secondly, the state laid the proper foundation to admit the officer's expert opinion as to how the HDN test indicated alcohol in this case, which is that the four out of six clues he observed indicated uh, correlated to a general impairing range of alcohol of 0.08 or higher. As to the first reason, the general rule in getting scientific admitted into evidence is that the scientific test must be both reliable and that the uh, procedures per, uh, were performed appropriately. The state satisfied the first finding through the holding, the reliability requirement through the holding in the 1996 Court of Appeals case, Hawkins v. State, where after, um, under a Harper analysis and after they received expert evidence from around the world, uh, they held that the HGN test has reached a stage of verifiable certainty and is admissible as a basis upon which an officer can determine a driver was impaired Council, to drive okay. due to alcohol. Let's, let's say that there was a opinion from the 1820s that says that bloodletting had uh, been established to a point of verifiable certainty as the appropriate remedy for particular maladies. Is it appropriate for the courts to uh, adhere to that going forward? 
Yes, it is. Um, I mean, unless there's any contrary authority or opinion otherwise. That's a big unless, right? <laughs> <laughs> there is, and the uh, and we are not aware of any um, current uh, authority that would suggest otherwise. So what did Hawkins, th this is the problem I have, is you're very imprecise about the science. What did Hawkins say was reliable? That HGN correlates with impairment, meaning that somebody may be intoxicated or less safe to drive, or that it correlates with blood alcohol content and a specific level. I've read Hawkins and it never talks about blood alcohol content related to HGN. No, but if you read Hawkins. So your no means it didn't establish that it was reliable for blood alcohol content. I don't know how it could when it never even talks about that. It does, and here's how it talks about it. In Hawkins, they cite to numerous articles uh, regarding the science behind the HGN test from around the world. And when you read these articles and these studies in these journals, it explains how the HGN test detects impairment, which is that the HGN test looks at impairment through the lens of a blood alcohol content level. Mr. Kennedy, I want to just ask you the base question and then go back to uh, Justice Namias and maybe Justice Boggs. Were you putting it in the horizontal gaze nystagmus test to show a percentage of alcohol in the blood? No, the state introduced that evidence to explain to the jury when the officer testified that the HDN test results indicated impairment. Why didn't he just testify to that? Once you tell a jury it's not just impairment, it's more than 0 .08, which every you know, intelligent adult should know means you are drunk, according to the state. Drunk enough to be convicted just on that. Then that's the end of things, right? No. But Okay, well, no in very esoteric argument, yes in reality. You think you can go tell a jury in a case, this person had a blood alcohol content of, of greater than 0.8% and your odds of winning don't go up astronomically? No, I do not agree with that. That depends on a lot of factors. And the testimony was, the record is clear, the officer's testimony was not that he determined the appellant had a specific BAC level. That was not his testimony. Right, he said he picked a nice number, which happens to be the number above which, whether it's 0.8 or 0.081, is the amount that automatically makes you drunk in the eyes of the state. So it's nice, I mean, if we say you're right, then officers can get away with just saying 0.08. It was above 0.08, as if 0.08 was some just a number taken out of the air. He didn't say above 0.06, did he? Because 0.06 would have been useless to the state, or 0.03. Not necessarily, it would be useless to the state. In this case, in this Why did he pick 0.08? Because that is the science behind the HGN test, is that it was designed by the authors of the test, going back to the- And where do you get that in the record of this case? You get that from the officer, and the officer, and. The state's argument is as the officer, which is why, bef I'll back him. Before he was asked about the correlation, the state laid the proper foundation according to the expert witness laws in this state to, uh, based on his training and uh, experience, and he testified importantly that um, <clears throat> based on the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of arrest he had made where the uh, defendant took a subsequent state administered test for their breath and or blood for to get a precise level of alcohol, he testified that he has personally seen the correlation between four or more clues and a BAC level of 0.08 or so is higher. Is that what you're based on? If that's the case, the science you're talking about is completely right. meaningless. If you're saying it's based on practical experience, then the usual Harper analysis, Hawkins, all of that is, is meaningless, irrelevant to your case. You're saying it's based on, it's like a Como tire about people's personal experience dealing with a situation. So which is it? 
It's both. It's, in this case, it's both. We've got the HGN test, which Hawkins looked at, and they, and they also considered studies done by the National uh, Highway Traffic and Safety Administration. Are those studies in the record here? Uh, they are not on the record, but the officer did uh, testify that uh, based on studies, he... Uh, so, so a single reference by an officer that studies support this incorporate by reference any studies that support it? I'm sorry, could you clarify your actual question? When, when a witness testifying as an expert says studies support the position I'm articulating, does that somehow incorporate by reference those studies into the record? It, it does. I mean, he did not identify them by name, but what the officer was testifying... Which to, studies did it incorporate into the record? Uh, the NHTSA studies, National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration studies. All of them? Possibly, yes. Well, it possibly is not good enough. So all of them, which ones? Any other studies? Well, the officer testified in detail to his training and to his, exper uh, to his training. And there he testified that he um, had taken become a certified drug recognition expert, and that he had taken the standardized field sobriety basics, that he had completed the advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement, and that he attended the medical foundations or visual Got system. That. that tells me nothing about any studies he's ever been told about, nor about any practical experience. Is there, is there any study that correlates the test to a .08 or higher? Yes, there are several National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. That has the exact same phrase. There's a correlation. Four out of six clues. Yes, and um, in the and then why isn't that in the record? Why sh why isn't that cited? Well, we use the officer Not, as you use the officer to bring to, to cite the article or the study. No, to state based on his training. Okay, so then we're based on training. So my question about training is, I don't know which of the four tests he's relying on. Does it vary depending on the combination of tests? What kind of record keeping did he keep to keep track and reach these conclusions? Or was it a finger in the air kind of judgment call? Was he real attentive to these issues? Those kinds of questions are the questions I would have. Well. That those questions were answered at trial when we laid the foundation as to his training and as to his experience. In but what? I mean, that's a, if, if you ask a, an officer, do you have training and experience? And he says, I got trained in this and that and the other. It's got to be linked to a specific piece of testimony. You don't become an expert in everything science by saying you've been trained or have experience. This is a, a game of precision, not a game of kind of, oh, I've got everything and I can testify, I can testify about impairment, I can testify about ranges. So to go back to Justice Milton's question, what uh, study, how, does, how did the study get into the record, the studies you refer to? There was not a particular title given to a particular study on the record, but on the record, the officer testified that through studies he learned there is a direct connection, a direct correlation between alcohol and um, blood alcohol concentrations. But that, that's, that supports the, the basis which nearly every state recognizes that the HGN is admissible for purposes of proving impairment. That, that's fine with that. But if the, under your theory that his personal experience in investigating over 400 DUIs and, there, and knowing in the cases where he gave, we got four out of six clues, that he also gave an intoxilizer test and therefore could correlate the HGN four to, four to six clues with an actual blood alcohol content, he could, he could extrapolate a specific number. Under your theory, if the foundation is appropriate based on his personal experience, he could average all 100 that he did the intoxilizer on and he could come up with a specific number, which you would agree is not, is not no court in this state has allowed a specific number. Even Kirkland and Webb say that's, that that's not appropriate. So he got around that by coming up with a range in this case, correct? Well, he stated that range a range. range is not a specific number. It's clearly not a specific number, and he didn't state that he determined. He that equivocates the, by saying generally. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. This is a granite surrogate, and we try to look at these cases in terms of what this is going to mean to the law going forward. And I'm looking at it from the standpoint. Does an affirmance in this case mean that this can now be the standard going forward in addressing DUI cases? Yes, and the uh, 
in trial when you introduce evidence received from an HGN test. It's always testimonial and a lot of times you have a video of it and the, um, the defendant looks for the most part completely sober because they have to remain still. And, in all, and you see, if it's on video, you see the officer, if it's just testimony, you hear the officer basically describe how they are being still and following their uh, stimulus with their eyes. An average juror has no idea what the uh, phrase indicates impairment, that four or more clues indicates impairment. In fact, um, an average juror would think, well, no, it looked like they were actually stone cold sober. So why did the officer state this test result indicated impairment. And if, that's if this is going to be a standard going forward, which you advocate that it will be, does this make Georgia consistent with other states in this area, or does it now make us a lot, an outlier? Well, most states in the country do allow HGN test results testimony to use as a basis for impairment. There are two other states that have... That's, I think that's right, but we're talking about impairment. When, are you saying, Mr. Kennedy, that the horizontal gaze nystagmus test, standing alone, can indicate to an expert the percent of alcohol in a person's blood? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And going forward, we have a machine that the officers have in their car, the intoxilizer, that actually measures blood alcohol content. You would say, rather than use that, you would use a, a actual measurement of blood alcohol content. An officer should be allowed to testify to blood alcohol content based on observation. All right, again, it's a correlation to a range of blood alcohol content. And the answer to that uh, the, question the, is the, yes. That whole range, baloney, to put it frankly, what, when, when you set the range, the bottom of the range at 0.08, it, it's not a range of any meaning. If the range correlated with something that isn't guilt, that might be something. But that's just a way to get around saying 0.085. I mean, it, once you set the quote unquote range at a point where the person's guilty, and not just guilty of less safe, but now guilty of per se. So once we approve this, the officer can say, I gave them an HGN test, they failed four out of six clues, and therefore they are guilty of per se, right? That's right. You wouldn't need an intoxilizer in those cases. I mean, to, to, to Mr. Thomas's point earlier, the end result would be that it would abrogate the uses of intoxilizers in its entirety if you were allowed to use the HGN to correlate to a specific blood alcohol content, or in this case, a range where the bottom of the range is above the per se statutory amount. No, that's not what we're saying, absolutely. But you could do that. You could do that. Counsel, let me come back to Justice Benham's question and, and reframe it slightly. If we affirm in this case, is it sufficient to satisfy the Harper standard to have an officer testify that based on his training and experience, studies have shown that a particular procedure has reached verifiable certainty? And just with that sentence to satisfy the Harper standard, without any discussion of what studies, without any review by the trial court of what those studies are, without any opportunity for the other side to refute the studies or to present their own studies. Is that sufficient to satisfy Harper? Yes, because that is the science that is behind the HGN test. What is the science? Is that it's indicative of a general impairing level of alcohol. But, I you? get that there's a study that I, says that, and you've attached it as an exhibit, but when the officer testifies, studies say, he doesn't say what studies. There's no discussion of the studies. There's no consideration of the studies. Not every science, not, not every study has the same scientific validity. So Harper is satisfied by the, by the bald statement, studies show this is good. Well, it, again, in this case, you've got an officer that has significant experience in administering it. That's a whole different, if you're going down that line, then you're back into Justice Boggs' question. So okay. we, you can't go back and forth. Is it science or is it experience? It's science and certainly experience in doing the test would help you to explain it to a jury. Is there any science out there, even ridiculous science, that says that National Highway Traffic Safety Administration studies are not perfectly accurate? Yes. Okay, so when the officer says studies say, how do we know that he's referring to the, the ones you think are good and not the ones you think are bad? 
Well, the officer is trained through his law enforcement, and you know it wasn't stated on the record. But he didn't but say which studies. So when he says studies, if there are good studies in your view and bad studies, how do we know which ones he's referring to? Because well, the ones that favor guilt? No, but I mean, the officer's credibility certainly is at stake. What, what if the trial? last study he read was from the New England Journal of Alchemy? <laughs> Uh, we have no idea what study he's talking about. It's not a credibility question. He actually read the study, and it actually said that. It's just no good. Mm -hmm. Like, so how does his reference to studies mean anything? Well, listen, at trial, cross-examination is a powerful tool, and the questions y'all have posed me are the questions that defense attorneys attack police officers every single day. Well, let and me ask you this, Mr. Uh, uh, I just want to make sure that I understand. You're saying the horizontal gaze and nystagmus test can tell you the percentage of alcohol in a person's blood. No, that's not what is being said. Well, what is being said? We're sta the science behind it is that uh, horizontal gaze and nystagmus increases with the more consumption of alcohol a person consumes. And that with this test, it was designed based on where the horizontal nystagmus is seen in the eyes. Is but you're saying it can tell you whether it's 0.08 or not, right? It's got to be because... It, it indicates that it might be, is what the testimony is and what the science shows. Well, is, from, a, from a trial court's perspective, you're saying that the officer can say, I've read studies that say this, and that's enough. Well, what if the defendant puts up an expert who says, I've read unspecified studies that say the opposite, and that's enough? What's a trial court supposed to do with no actual evidence in front of them to make that Harper analysis? You mean if, to try to get this testimony admitted? Well, sure. If you have if you have one one expert testifying that studies show that this that this evidence is reliable and verifiable, and another expert says, "No, it's not. I've seen studies too." How is the trial court supposed to sort those out? I, well, it's they're the gatekeeper, and they'll just have to do that job. But and with the you know, but the, how do they do it without knowing what the studies are and having the studies in front of them? I, I understand your question, and 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 the studies would be necessary, and certainly certainly anything the witnesses were relying on would be counsel necessary. to take your argument to its logical conclusion. You would agree with me that the standard field sobriety tests promulgated by the National Highway Safety Traffic Administration include those three batteries of test: mm -hmm. H and G, walk and turn and one leg stand, correct? Correct. All three of those have been proven to show impairment, correct? Correct. So under your analysis, if an officer not using the HNG uh, or HGN but uses the walk and turn and the one-legged stand has some empirical anecdotal evidence that every time I've given the walk and stand uh, or the one-legged stand, the blood alcohol content has been above 0.08, under your argument, they could use those to come up with testimony concerning specific blood alcohol content correlated to those field sobriety tests as well, correct? Yeah, yes, and if I may respond, the uh, difference between the HGN and the walk and, and the other two tests, the other two tests, a juror can sit there and listen to the testimony and or watch a video. Balance and mental acuity are within the average key yeah, of well, that jury. They don't need expert testimony. Right, exactly. But And just in closing, we would uh, direct the court to look at the states of North Carolina and Montana. The Supreme Court of Montana has ruled that under their rules of evidence statute 702, um, that in 2012, the case is State v. Bowman, B-O-L-L-M-A-N-272-P3-D-650, 2012 case that um, uh, the officer in that case. We'll take a look at that. Thank you. I and also think. North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thomas, I think you have about three minutes on rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I know you don't particularly want to hear about those arson dogs, but that is exactly the case where they, uh, these expert arson guys came in and said, yeah, we, we, these dogs have been right. It's our training that they're right. And you said, no, that's not enough. In Bravo, they did introduce the studies. The reason why we don't like the studies is the studies are by NHTSA. NHTSA also invented the field sobriety test, so they're basically doing studies on their own invention, saying, hey, our invention is great. Uh, the sample sizes are small. We could, we could have that fight someday about the science of the HGN. We didn't have it in this case because this, I don't, I'm looking through the transcript trying to find any reference to when he even said anything about studies. It's certainly, his answer was based on my training and experience. That's, that's why I can say 
it's 0.08 or higher. In other words, it's the legal limit or higher. It's not 0.06 to 0.09. And, I, and there is a case, uh, Travis, where, where a state trooper got six out of six, and the actual, the actual result on the thing was 0.037. The NHTSA studies are going to, they, they miss them every well, once in a while. Do you know the breakdown of other states? I mean, on impairment, generally, it seems to be fairly uniform uh, that HDN can be introduced as evidence of impairment but on, on a range or a range that starts at 0.08, what's your understanding of, of the breakdown? I was sitting at the table just thinking I should have done a comprehensive search and figured out how many of our sister states are on one side of this or another. I can only refer you to the footnote in Bravo, and I know that's not, that's yeah. not adequate. And they said this is consistent with what most people have found. I, I'm, I'm not aware of many states that allow it to replace an intoxilizer. Are you aware of any states that allow it to replace an intoxilizer? Uh, no, I'm not, but uh, but that's not not because I just did a diligent search last night. It's because I honestly don't know the answer to your question. Counsel, it, I, I know the study that the state attached to their brief is not in the record, but when you actually review that study at pages 10 and page 28, it actually says that HGN is not correlated to impairment, that it's designed to correlate to blood alcohol content. Given that this is a less safe case and not a per se case, and given that blood alcohol content does not necessarily correlate to impairment, why was his testimony sufficient to convict your client? Because Is evidence that she was 0.08 sufficient to convict her of less safe? Um, yes, that, that would once again be back to Webb, where they, the whole <coughs> argument was, is it relevant, is it even relevant in a less safe case what their blood alcohol content is coming through an HGN. And the Court of Appeals, not you, the Court of Appeals said, yes, that's extremely relevant. Every, every, every thinking adult in Georgia should know that 0.08 is the limit by which you cannot drive a car. That's just, that's the per se limit. End of argument. As a matter of law, but not necessarily as a matter of fact. I understand that, but it's okay. a devastating piece of evidence that the state should not have been allowed to present uh, that, that I'm pretty sure pushed us over on this one. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, and, and thank you, lady, also, for your appearance in the argument today. Uh, please be safe as you go home. Thank you very much.